Hey friends, you may recall that I interviewed Thomas Oldehuvelt for the Sun Tup edition of Hex. He was a great guy. He talked a lot about his upcoming book, Echo. Well, that book came out. I got an arc of it. I read it, loved it. When I was about halfway through it, I um, messaged him and I said, would you like to talk about Echo? He said, I have 90 minutes on February 9th to chat. I have this little window of time. You could take an hour in that window of time. I said, oh, that, that's awesome. It's the day after the book was released in the U.S. So um, I'm getting this video out so you can see and, and hear from Thomas Old Huvald himself about this book, about my reaction to it. I did a review if you want to check that out as well. But I recommend everybody go get that book. It's out in the U.S., it's out in the UK and the English speaking world. It's an amazing book. I think um, no doubt that he is an author with a very brilliant future. Um, I'm even excited for the next one, which will be Oracle, and that's coming out in 2023. But check out the interview. He's a great guy on top of being a brilliant storyteller and um, providing me with the first book that scared me in a long time. So check it out. I hope you like it and get Echo today. Ah, for once, I'm not talking to myself. It's time to go beyond the book and get over your shell. Hey, Thomas. Hey, hey good to see you. It's good seeing you. So glad you could make the time. You've been a very busy man. <laughs> Of course, I really love the last conversation. So, of course. So, and I, I love how you've been promoting the book with, um, you've done a lot of social media, a lot of those Instagram AMAs, Ask Me, Ask Me Anything. That was really cool. I think yeah. Show the Mountain, it, it, <laughs> I loved it. Yeah, it, 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 it's fun. It, it's great to, um, it, it's so good that the book is finally out. I'm so happy. It, it's, uh, oh man, I, I waited a long time for it. And I know the readers have waited even longer for it. So. What, what's that like to have the the release because it was a book that was already out and received and now it's yeah. the only difference is it's in the english speaking world and you know north america england and um yeah. so how how did how does that feel to have the it's like you get two releases oh yeah several actually i had one in germany last oh. october um and there will be more later on but this is the big one of course for north america and for britain uh the british edition came out last week as well uh, yeah, i mean it's just such a thrill to you know if, if you come from a small country like the netherlands and if you have about 25 million people in the world speaking your language yeah um, it is a wild idea to break beyond those language barriers and when i did it with hex in 2016 um, I always had that fear that it would be like a one-off thing, like that would be just, you know, oh, you right, repeat, right. repeat the trick basically. Um, but I'm so happy that, you know, it, it turned out well and that now uh, Echo is here and many books will follow. Well, I like hearing that because that, that's obviously what I want to end the conversation with. I want to know what's next. But um, how's the reception been so far with uh, the English speaking world uh, getting this book? Fantastic. It's been so welcoming. I, I, I love how people around the world embrace this book. I get messages from Australia and New Zealand. I get messages from Canada, from the United States, all over the place. It, it's it's just it's just thrilling to see how apparently how many people were touched by hex and were especially frightened by it obviously yeah um and it's funny because it's not, now it's the early day so i get all the messages and the tweets about like the opening scene of the book <laughs> <laughs> I, I you know and the thing the funny thing about that is we talked about it last time and you said oh, i had this idea and it's you know i had this opening scene you told me what was going to happen <laughs> and when i sat down and read it i still I still wasn't ready for it. I was, I mean, that is terrifying. Yeah, thank you. That is a huge compliment. I, I'm, you know, um, that that is the goal when, when you write these kind of stories. You want to crawl under your reader's skin and grab him by the throat. And an echo, I did it like in the first 15 pages, I think so. Yeah. 
Yeah, that when 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 I it just I think that and I'm not going to spoil it for any viewers, but there's there's a couple of things, a couple of the little descriptions in there that made it go boom. Because I think well, what's that for you? For me, it was the when when she just uh, I don't know if she's describing it to Sam or if she's thinking it whatever. It's the look on on the woman's face. Mm. Um, she, the, the, she her impression is that this woman looks like she wants to kill her like just the, the way that was described and and the idea of that anger and hatred i think both those things combined yeah the I real think. malice i it, it was like a touchstone and it that that's what lit my nerves up and yeah, i think i'm I, um, I described some something as like that it was a face that was just on the brink of screaming all the time, but it just doesn't scream, but it's on the brink of screaming. <laughs> and I think, yeah, and I think that's, you know, just, you know, just that they move a little closer and a little closer and 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 there's no escape. And when no I got to the end, <laughs> when I got to the end of the prologue, I'm like, what is, like, where does this go? And it took me, a, you know, you, you keep reading, you realize this is, this is foreshadowing. This is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, and, and and the rest of the ride <laughs> yeah and the rest of the ride there was amazing i you know i loved hex and i said uh hex was a was if hex was a home run this was a grand slam this no, um, had had so much had had all the things that i want because <clears throat> there are a lot of good page turners that have an interesting story or an interesting concept and and it plays out and you don't really get deep or the other end of that is you go too deep and you don't get enough action like or enough 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 what's next you know there's there's a lot of books out there that you just love to get lost in but you're not really you just like being there this had both of them i think um <clears throat> and i've i i seriously i have not been scared a lot of a lot of these groups say like you know what what's this book that scared you i'm like i Stephen King really hasn't scared me since probably the Tommyknockers and Pet Cemetery scared me. Um, mm. And I'm like, but they're, they're interesting books. They're creepy. This oh, yeah. actually, uh, there were, there were scares in here and that was, that caught me off guard. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, it, it, it's what you say. It, it's a very, it's a very character driven story. Both Nick and Sam, you, um, you are in their heads because it is about their obsession for each other. Um, yeah. And on top of that, there's just a lot of, you know, uh, there's all the outdoor stuff. It's full of action. It's all the the horrors, the the, the legends, the mythology. So I wanted to to do both. Yeah, I, I did love that split narrative thing. And I, I wanted to ask you, how tough was that? Because you have a distinct voice in Sam, who's a little flashy and he's a little shallow, at least in the early outset of the book. And then you have Nick, who's super intelligent and powerful. Like you felt like this is a capable man. <clears throat> and, and yet both felt like I was reading from two different people and knowing it comes from one author. How, how difficult was that to create those two separate voices? Well, I'm happy it read that way because uh, they are very different people. Um, uh, Nick is a journalist from the Netherlands, um, which is stylistically very different than a young uh, New Yorker who yeah. linguist, uh, very intelligent as well, uh, full of languages, playing with language. Um, and as a non-Dutch speaker, uh, as a non-English speaker, it was quite tough to, to do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Even though I studied English language and American right. studies at university, uh, still it was quite a challenge. And mind you, there, there, there is a slight difference in the Dutch edition of the book and the um, English uh, translation of the book, because in the Dutch edition of the book, Sam, as a linguist, was writing in Dutch, but with a oh. um, American grammar in, in you know, uh, induced language. Oh. I see. Uh, so it gave this very unique voice to him. And when we were talking about, so how are we going to translate that? Because if you just translate it, it just becomes American English. And right. We, um, so we discussed this a lot with the publisher and with the translator. And most Gilula, who translated Echo, he did a fantastic job, I think, with 
you know, creating this unique voice for Sam, which is very flamboyant and full of, you know, uh, play of language and, right. and cultural pop culture references everywhere. Um, and indeed may seem shallow at the beginning, but also I think very real because his, his, his fears are very real. I think everyone, I mean, he asked the, the very question in the first chapter, what would you do if right. your partner is maimed forever, if it's burnt in an accident or whatever? And we'd all say, yeah, of course we'd stay with them because it's not about the looks. But in reality, you know, um, when it actually happens, it becomes a difficult issue. And Sam acknowledges that. And in the end, he doesn't turn out to be a shallow person. Um, so no, then- no. Right. And I think that's what I loved about it is, is that voice was allowed to be counterbalanced to Nick. Yeah. And you, you understand sort of the, it, it's shallow by comparison. And I think that was an interesting thing you did in there because all these young love couples will always say, will you love me when I'm old? And, and everybody yeah. tries to nail that down from the outset. Um, and, and we all say those things to each other and it's always, um, yeah, but that's never gonna happen. Yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> and then it does. And uh, and then it becomes very real. But right, he, he doesn't prove to be shallow in the end. But I always took it as Sam was obsessed with Nick and Nick was obsessed with the mountain. I didn't oh. really think he was too obsessed with Sam that much, as much as he needed Sam, because that his his whole connection to the real world was through Sam. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, um, but I did like how you had those two voices, but also languages played a big part in the book. Um, and I didn't know if that, if, if I, it, did that mean anything? Did that, uh, w- was there an underlying text? Because there's, there's la- human languages, then the language of the mountain speaking through Nick, um, and then they're giving each their story. And so I was just wondering about that. Like, because you, you go, you make an effort to talk about multiple languages, especially yeah. through Sam. Mm-hmm. I mean, Echo in the End, is a, it's a story about stories, right? It, it, it's, it's my love letter to the Gothic novel. Um, it is uh, written um, as a Gothic novel, as a homage to the Gothic novel. Many of the, of the pieces are in diary form or in emails or in, you know, uh, notes, uh, manuscripts, or you know the classic uh, forms of the Gothic novel, and language is is a big part of stories. Obviously, um, um, there is the all the, the language barriers between people. You know, this couple who goes to Switzerland, where they speak dialect French high up in the mountains. Um, so everyone outside, even even the house cleaner who's lived there for, for yeah. 20 years or so is still seen as an outsider. Right. That's how these small towns in the mountains work. Uh, you never really become an insider unless you're born there. And Nick, by definition, is an outsider. But he's become an insider because he's become the mountain, obviously. Yeah. Um, so yeah, l- language and story is a big part of, 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 of Echo. And, and very similar to Hex, too, because lore, that's the one thing I kept coming back to is is the idea of lore and um, and and in hex it's this ancient evil that persists and people live with it, and then yeah. in 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 this book uh, they they have the birds in the cages. It's an ancient evil. They've come to live with it. It doesn't even show up on the internet. This mountain and how do you hide oh, a mountain? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and so and and the only place they could find any evidence of this mountain is this one photograph in that pub, uh, yeah. any solid proof anyway. Um, and lore, yeah. So all the all those things, and I, I really like how in both books, Hex and Echo, you breathe new life into these old legends. Like, are are you supposed to discount them as just stories people tell, or? Like, how does that manifest in a world where everything's photographed and yeah. everything has proof? It is so interesting to play with what people believe and people deal with the supernatural in very different ways. When I, uh, years ago, I studied in Ottawa in Canada, uh, the University of Ottawa, and there was this course called uh, Witchcraft, Magic, and the Occult Tradition. It's how cultures worldwide deal with the supernatural. And they 
they showed us that wherever you go, people basically fear the same things. And I've experienced that with Hacks because Hacks huh. was published around the world. And whether people from uh, Canada or China or India or South America read it, they're all fearing that, you know, figure that just stands there at your bedside watching you from there behind the closed eyes, of course. Um, <laughs> They all fear the same thing, but how to deal with the supernatural is very different. And especially if you have cultures that are so secluded, like those mountain villages, um, their folklore and their myths, you know, they're very much around the surroundings about the nature around them. Um, and that's classic Gothic novel because mm -hmm. the classic Gothic novel obviously spoke Daddy. about nature and the sublime about being awestruck by this these vast mountains the vast seas the vast uh, cloudscapes what have you you know um uh, be 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 you know appalled by it at the same time as it is beautiful yeah um, yeah and of course stories erupt from that of course people believe in things when you know you have to explain the natural phenomena that occur when you have to explain just the sense that overwhelms you when you stand in front of this huge cascading mountain face um i experienced it i i haven't been you know i wasn't raised religiously um but i'm a mountaineer whenever i'm in the mountains i sense the life in the rock and the ice and it it overpowers you and it's an experience that you know, monks and gurus and seers went up to the mountains. They've come down and they they explain it as you know experiences of of of, of God of, of of higher powers. But you don't have to be a seer to experience that. As a climber, you touch base with it every time, and then it's it's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah. There there seems to be life in the mountains. So how did you? Um, I, I thought it was interesting because uh, especially during the first part of the book, we're we're much more with Sam. And he doesn't care about mountaineering. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I, I thought that was so interesting because you have a love of this and, and, and you do it yourself, you climb. And so you took that position of, well, you know, why does he have to go? What does he have to prove to anyone? Um, but how did you feel? Um, it, it, it comes through. The, your, your mountaineering experience definitely comes through. And I think that's one beautiful thing about the book is I don't climb mountains, but <laughs> it, it did feel like I was up there. I had vertigo, you know, and, and awesome. that, that scene where the helmet falls. Oh, yeah. Um, that literally happened to me. Oh, that, yeah. That, that scene on that very mountain is called the Zeno Roadhorn. It's a mountain here in Switzerland. Um, there, there is this rock ridge that you climb up to the summit, and that's there's a passage. It's like a vertical ledge that's called the donkey's bag, uh, La Brique. <laughs> Uh, so you, you sit with one leg on the eastern face and with one leg on the western face, and there's glaciers below, like a mile below you on both sides. And halfway that, you know, traverse, my climbing buddy and I were facing each other sitting on the donkey's back. And my climbing buddy looked down into the void. And when we'd been to the summit, he'd forgotten to strap his helmet. So his helmet tumbled off his head. And I, for, for a second, I had the illusion that his hat was stumbling off and it was really freaky. <laughs> oh my God. You know, it, did you, did you feel like part of you was falling too? Cause it, there, there's a sense of when something falls, you like then feel connected to it in a way. Oh yes. You, you I mean, it, it, you, you, my imagination is very vivid and it's easy to imagine what, 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 what if a person would be uh, attached to the helmet. What, what if you see the flailing limbs? What if you hear that dying scream coming up? It's, it, it's the same sense as some people get when they're on like a train station and this train's coming very fast or when people are standing, you know, at a fence on top of an edge and looking down, you need to jump. It's that same sense that, that yeah. it, it, it plays with your mind and it's pretty, pretty scary sometimes. Have you, have you ever gone up and then suddenly were, did you like, you're obviously not afraid of heights, or are you? I have just enough vertigo to not do stupid things. I've actually, <laughs> you know, me and my climbing buddy, um, we always used to call ourselves 
two sensitive guys in the mountains because we i mean we turn around more often than we actually hit summits oh wow um, and it's probably a good thing because as soon as one of you has doubts about the climb it's wrong to go up because it is a dangerous thing and you cannot control everything right every every circumstance you, you cannot control that so it's wise to turn back in time before you get yourself into situations where you cannot turn back from yeah i i i i'd be somebody who would work up the courage to go up i'd get up the mountain as far as i could and then you, they'd have to send a helicopter because <laughs> mm. i probably wouldn't be able to come back down at least <laughs> And then your phone doesn't have reception probably. So. No, yeah, right, <laughs> right. Um, I, I thought it was also interesting that, um, this is just a little tidbit, but when I was reading the book, you worked in there a neighborhood watch app in uh, into the story of yeah. in the village mm -hmm. town. And that took me right back to Hex. But, you know, I thought, I, I don't know if that was your in, intentional to put a little wink in there back to Hex or uh, if it just naturally came about because I could see that being the case. Well, it, it 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 was it did naturally come about because I wanted to show that even though there's all this lore in those mountain villages and they seem like very traditional places with rituals and with you know their 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 costumes that they still wear on 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 uh, festive days, but at the same time it's Switzerland 2020 something yeah. and and uh, the, the, it's a modern society and they, they do have drones and they do have apps and they you know uh, just like everyone else, um, right. They do have that particle collider uh, underneath Geneva and the mountains there. So uh, yeah, the hydra. <laughs> and yeah, they're, they're kind of advanced people. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And there's that scene. Uh, I won't give context to avoid spoilers, but there's a scene in Echo where there those two worlds collide because there's this huge bird coming from the mountains, um, and there's this drone, and the bird attacks the drone. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, and then you know it's where these two worlds of technology and the ancient mountains and nature collide i love that um you know i think uh like i said before with the lore you're you're bringing the lore into the modern era um i i, I do remember um somebody once said you can't write a really good suspenseful slasher movie because now everybody has phones and everything's filmed and all that but you found a way to integrate that and in a very believable way. But what I think I really, really loved and, um, and and part of why I think Echo is the whole package, it has the horror, it has, you care about the relationships of the people. And, um, but you've reinvented possession. And I didn't think that, I mean, cause you, you, you talk about um, the mountain possessing a person and I know I'm not spoiling anything there. No. But it's how that possession behaves once it has that vessel that I thought was brilliant and, and, and absolutely terrifying. Because normally when I see, like, um, when I think of exorcist or I think of possession, I think that's a tragedy for that person and that family. And that's awful, you know, if, if that's to be believed and, and that it actually happened or whatever. Mm -hmm. But this takes that den danger and, and escalates it. Well, first of all, thank you so much. That's a huge compliment. Um, Echo, I set out to write Echo as a possession novel. I, I what, what I like to do when I write books, is I take a trope from the genre and try to, try to twist it around in a fresh way. And Hex, I, Hex was basically my modern play on, on the witchcraft story, of course. Um, Echo is a possession story. But what I don't like about possession stories is that there's always the religious aspect right there's always right. a demon a devil always the church the the the, the, the priest who comes to exercise right. the entity um but possession is about so much more and like i said whenever i feel i'm in the mountains i can almost sense the life in the rock and the ice and i think wouldn't it be cool if this dude gets just possessed by this force of nature and if that indeed happens what does it even look like when yeah. you're by force of nature? Because a devil or a demon, like in The Exorcist, has a goal. It wants something. Nature doesn't want anything. Nature is there. It's just bigger than us. Mm -hmm. So I figure what it does is that it, it triggers your inner um, desires and your inner 
violence and 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 erupts that and you know exponentially um there's a scene uh in the book where something awful happens to a pretty young version of nick when he's younger when he goes to the mountains for the first time um yeah and yeah. he finds a wounded Ibex. Ibex, yeah, yeah. And um, I won't spoil what happens, but it kind of foreplays what is going to happen later in the book and suggests that there's something there that's always been in him. And I like that connection because you do it also with Sam. Um, to a larger extent, Nick gets that that connection back to his experience on the mountain and how, how that love is born of something with a little bit something extra to it. Mm -hmm. And 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 Sam's the same way, where he has this uh, expedition to the mountain um, in, in in the cabin, and and how how that plays out. So I did like that. I, I thought you know it's not just multi generational and and through the centuries, but it's also within families. And how do we carry those oh, yeah. stories and sins forward? Um, yeah. Because in the end, we, when it is fun to think of a concept like that. What, what if there is a person who's possessed by this force of nature? How does it affect the people around them? Um, and I figured, what would it be like if you stand in front of a person who's possessed by a mountain? Would you sense the mountain in that person? Would a person look bigger? Would you just sense it as bigger? Would you feel the storm? Would you feel the avalanches? Would you, you know, uh, the rumbling of the rocks? How, how does it work out? I mean, it's, it's ultimate freedom as a writer. It's, it's, it's great to experiment with. Yeah, but because um, when, when you said that in the last interview, I'm like possessed by a mountain. I had the, my your brain does start to go. Mm. My brain would have never gone here. <laughs> I, <laughs> I like that. That is, you know, I think that's what makes comedy, horror, all the fiction that I like is the stuff I never would have thought of. And so when that's served up to you, your brain just feasts on all that newness, and yeah. and and that's why. I think it's a particularly big challenge to reinvent something that we all know instead of just inventing something new. So for example, Stephen King did not invent the werewolf. Mm -hmm. um, and he didn't reinvent the werewolf. What he did was he gave us Pennywise, you know? Yeah. So, but because that's in a way, it's, it's, not, it's not easy and I'm not trying to dismiss it. But in a way, it's easier to create something new and say, I own this. This is how that behaves. And that's why it behaves that way. Yeah. To, to take something we all know, possession, witches, and to say, you ever think about this? Uh, and you add it without making it feel like a retread, I think is a much harder task. Because you're going against what everybody already believes. Sure. I mean, a lot of people have tried it with vampires, of course, that that concept has been reinvited many, right. many times uh, over and over to all extremes. Um, and zombies. Two, yeah, oh yeah, definitely. And there's a new adaptation coming up from Salem's Lot by Stephen King. Mm -hmm. and I really look forward to see how, you know, they make the vampire scary again, because it's supposed to be a scary film. Right, right. Um, and after Twilight, vampires are uh, not really scary. <laughs> well, you know, that's that's when they invented them out of existence. Like they reinvented them so much, yeah. they, I think, ruined them. So, um, but yeah. But, you know, I thought that of witches as well. I hadn't read a modern day witch story in a long, long time. Uh, so I figured, you know, this has been on for a long time. So how can we twist it around in, in a fresh way? And And yeah. It, it, it's 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 great experiment yeah it it I, I i thought you know i was heartened but also a little annoyed that you wrote such a great book and published it at the first of the year so like 2022 is going to start out with this book that i think is absolutely perfect and then where do i go from here in my fiction reading you've ruined the rest of the year for me i don't know how i'm going to keep going <laughs> There will be many good books, I'm pretty sure. I hope so. Thank you so much. Um, talk about the section titles. Did you create those before you wrote the chapters? Or did you look back and say, all right, that's Haunting of Hill House. This is, how did that come about? Um, I'm a pretty structured writer in the way that I write in the order that you are reading it. I, I don't plan out ahead 
very far, a little bit, but not very far. So I never write chapters that are going to be like halfway in the book or at the end of the book if I haven't write the beginning yet. Um, so I go basically from A to B to C to Z in the end. Um, uh. That said, so I wanted to give, because this is my love letter to the Gothic novel. So I wanted to give every, every chapter a title of one of the classics, mm -hmm. uh, modern day classics like uh, Misery or uh, In the Hills of Cities by Clive Barker to, you know, Turn of the Screws, The Mountains of Madness. Well, that was an obvious one, obviously. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and it's interesting when, when there are so many, be because um, the Gothic and the Sublime um, deals with nature so often, there are so many good epitaphs, good mottos, uh, from those books that deal with nature or with mm. possession or with being awestruck and then um, most were very easy to find there were some I had a bit more trouble with but but you know every epitaph of course you know foreshadows something that's going to happen in that chapter right uh, they just was, seemed to fit so well I mean they were oh, yeah. they were perfectly <laughs> suited yeah yeah um, it, it worked out well you know the hardest part of that was to get uh, a lot of the, a lot of the permissions uh, oh right right because you know uh, a good part of them are in the public domain because they are very old um the live ones gave us permission right away for instance stephen king clive bark was very happy that they uh, uh, uh. Allowed to use their epitaphs um but the um, the ones who were deceased like um the, the estate of shirley jackson for instance or the estate of ray bradbury uh, it was sometimes hard to yeah. chase that down, but it, but in the end, it all worked out, and I'm very happy that they uh, allowed me to use them all. Has Stephen King blurbed about your book yet? Not yet. No, Not I, yet. I, hope, I hope he's reading it. <laughs> I don't think he could deny it. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I also thought of, you know, the, the comparison was made between Pet Cemetery and Hex. This book definitely felt like The Shining, you know, obviously the winter, the shut-in, mm -hmm. but also, you know, the Overlook does try to possess or influence Jack. Mm -hmm. So I thought some similarities there, but... Um, Interesting, yeah. Yeah, but obviously, I mean, totally something absolutely different than anything King would write, I think. Um, and I mean that as a compliment because... Uh, I don't, you know, I think that his language, the prose in here is beautiful. I think there's a lot, and it's between the two writers. I think Nick is a better writer than Sam, but I think both of them, uh, they express some things. And, and some mm -hmm. of the ways Sam expresses shows a comfort with language and a, and a, a beauty, an appreciation of the beauty of language, too. Yeah. Even if he sometimes uses it to be a little more manipulative or a little more uh, flashy, he's yeah. still, you could still, and, and that's the thing. So Sam's parts, like these are written from Sam and Nick and they're intended to be read. So obviously this is what they're, that's not what they're thinking. It's what they're putting out there. Yeah. And you could see around everything Sam's saying that all that is defense of his heart. And like, he's a sensitive guy. Oh yeah. He, he's trying to bluster a little. It's straight from the heart. He, he, I mean, it's so straight from the heart that he tries to, um, you know, um, mask it with right. all the, the the outside with with the with with the deal that he should, you know hangs around him basically to not you know bear himself too much. Um, but it is all hard, definitely. Uh, yeah, it is. It in a sense, Echo is is a love story. It it it's a oh for sure. Yeah, um, and with with Sam more than Nick, Nick even I think yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it, it he's uh, yeah he's he's not shallow. I mean, he, he could have just took off, stayed in New York, been done with it all. Yeah, wished you know Nick the best and just ch chalked it up as oh that's that's my past and I'm moving on. Um, he comes back. Yeah, yeah, and. And, and how it affects him. Like, so that's the other thing when I was saying about how um, I think the things I like the most are the things I never would have thought of. And to see the way Sam changes and is perhaps 
perhaps changed by Nick going toward the end and uh, gets to be obsessed himself even more so where I, you know, I, I, a lot of times when these stories are somebody's afflicted and then a family member is trying to help them, there's desperation, there's frustration, and the, but it doesn't ever like, oh, I can turn this to my advantage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, imagine if your boyfriend, the love of your life, becomes this mountain god, if you will. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's overwhelming. It is freaky as hell. But at the same time, it could be sexy and it could be... Yeah, yeah. It could be larger than life and it could be something you actually fall in love with. And Sam very much gets um, in over his head. And as he still wants to save Nick and free the, free the world of this, this, this power, he's also seduced by it. Yeah. Yes. Because that's what happens. I mean, the, the longer you stay on a mountain, the more you get acclimatized to it. Man, I'm so glad I never climbed a mountain. I'd have to do it all the time. Uh, do you ever do base jumping where you jump off and then? I have never done that. It it terrifies the hell out of me. Yeah, I don't think they they said that it's like the one of the most dangerous things to do, but it looks so beautiful. Uh, it does. If you see these Instagram clips where you fall yeah. off the driver and then oh man, it, yeah, it, it's it. What's the tallest you've ever climbed? What's the highest point? So in the United States, when I was younger, I climbed Long Peak in Colorado. Um, but in the Alps, I've done some higher and more challenging stuff. You know, I, I'm in a, a bit of a combination of rock and ice climber. Um, the highest mountain I've climbed is called Dom Blanche. It's in, not like the ice cream, but Dom Blanche was like <laughs> uh, white teeth, basically. Okay. Uh, uh, it's It looks like a white tooth. And wow. um, uh, it's, it's very steep, very beautiful. Uh I, I think it's 4,300 something meters high. Forgive uh, me if that's rude because I, I'm, not in, I'm not in the mountaineer culture. So uh, a friend of mine I used to work with told me you never ask a marathon runner their time. So I don't know if asking a mountaineer their, their altitude is like wrong. No, so. no, not at all. Because, you know, it is not. Mountaineering is definitely a sport, but it's not a sport where you need to win anything. It is a sport right. that you do to see places, to have an experience. You, for a long time, you look up at this magnificent summit and you want to stand on that summit because you want to conquer that mountain. Um, and it's, a, it's an experience, it's a journey, it's a voyage to, to get there. And when you've done it, you've accomplished it, but you only really accomplish it when you are down in a valley and you can look back at the mountain and say, you know, I've wow. been there. Um, but it's not not it's not a competitive not a competitive thing. It's a thing that you want to experience yourself. The most beautiful part of mountaineering, I think, is to be there with your climbing buddy and no one else is there, and you have the sense that you are on a place alone on top of the world where no one has ever trod before you. Is there a certain um is there a certain personality type that likes to mountain climb? Is it like an introvert? Are, are there people that like that stillness? It is a very meditative experience. Yeah. Whenever I go to the mountains, I always, you know, beforehand I tell myself, you know, it, I like, I have to walk up for hours and hours. So I'm going to plot a new story or going to plot part of the book out when, I, when I'm doing it. But that never works. Your mind is always completely in the moment. It's, it's blank. And you come back so relaxed and oh. renewed and revigorated. And, and um, it is an experience of meditation in that sense. Yeah, I, there's that one passage in the book that talks about how mountain climbers chop off the handles on their toothbrushes <laughs> to reduce the load and how, yeah, there's, there's no journal. You're not going to bring up a journal. In fact, oh. that, that one mountain climber, brought up a um a, a book that the, a, a mountain guide i climbed with used to do that he, he, yeah. he bought these really small pocket books on the airport or something on a train station and whenever he um had finished the page he would rip it out and use it as toilet paper because yeah. it, it weight. <laughs> so he saves money on bookmarks too but yeah. um <laughs> but you know that those details and and 
like I said, I was I was captivated and educated by the book. So I love that too, to to get that insight into what it means. And those details highlight the desperation and how this is really you're on your own. You you have to conserve and you have to plan. And it's a serious type of individual. It is. And at the same time, it is also a little bit egocentric because Hmm. you touched early on the subject that indeed Sam hates the mountains. And I've come to realize, you know, I, I have been in a relationship now for over eight years. And I've come to realize that my partner doesn't really like it when I go up there. And I understand why, because it is a dangerous thing. And there are factors that are beyond your control. Um, And whenever I read uh, the police website in Switzerland and I see the messages there from, hey, two climbers have fallen down on that particular peak where I was yesterday. And those two people didn't set out that morning with the idea that that they were going to die up there. I didn't, but they didn't either. And they did. Um, So it is a kind of scary operation. And you have to think of what you do to your loved ones when you do that. So I, now I slowly grow a little bit more mature and older. I, (laughs) I don't climb as ambitiously anymore as I used to because there is more to life than only that. Yeah. Um, and so you don't, you don't feel obsessed. You don't feel like you can't stop climbing. Cause I get that sense from Nick. Yeah. There was a time that I felt like that, huh. um, but I've experienced enough um, danger up there and enough scary situations that I value it more to, you know, come back alive and to actually go up there every time. Well, it fueled a lot of, really great reading so you you've brought more down from the mountain than you realized because uh the, you, you brought me up there you brought your readers up there with you so i appreciate um, that <laughs> yeah that's uh that's are there going to be any limited of echo Is, fingers crossed yeah no, uh, uh, the, fingers crossed Sons of did a fantastic edition for hacks obviously um i think it's completely sold out it's mind-boggling um yeah there are there are editions that came out after hex that still have copies available but hex is gone um it's all buttoned up so yeah i think there's a lot of people out there and i i still can't get over that there are only two of your books available to me in english uh how many other books have you written so Hex was Hex is the one that came before Echo. It was my fifth novel, actually. Um, two of them were with a really small publishing house. The two others were with a bigger publishing house, but Hex was my breakthrough novel in the Netherlands. Okay. Uh, and it only broke through after it was published in the United States. It was when right. Stephen King tweeted about it. And I went on tour in North America for six weeks. That Dutch media jumped on the book and then it became an instant bestseller. Um, or I have to say an overnight bestseller, not an instant bestseller. Right. And um, Echo is the one that I wrote after X. I had a new one out recently in Holland called Oracle that will be out in North America and in Britain in about a year's time. Yeah. Um, it is in tra- translation almost done, actually. Um, What's that book about? So Oracle, it, Oracle's a fun book. Uh, Oracle is basically one Dutch reader described it as it's like a James Bond movie with horror. Very action packed. It's about a group of children when they bike to school one morning in a misty flower field in December, they see this old fashioned Dutch sailing ship in the field. Uh, It's on its side, uh, isn't supposed to be there. It wasn't there the day before. How did did it get there? There's, you know, on the deck, there's a hatch and it's open. And a couple of the kids go inside to take a peek, but they don't come out anymore. So one one of the kids calls their parents and the father comes and he goes in and he doesn't come out either. And then they call the police and the search team goes in and they don't come out either. So there's something really messed up going on there um and the secret services are 
are confronted with this problem that's way bigger than them and they have to keep it secret. And so they have to find a specialist who knows how to keep this stuff secret. Wow. And I figured, you know, I once wrote about a specialist who knows how to keep this kind of stuff. Ah, there you go. So Robert Grimm, the guy who ran the Hex Control Center in Hex, (laughs) <laughs> uh, retired now for 10 years apparently survived this ordeal in black spring yeah uh, um put on this expensive retirement to to buy a silence basically um is put on the case to research this new freaky thing wow is it a big book is it is it it's longer it is about the size of echo so okay, it's, it's quite 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 a decent sized book yeah that is so cool are you are, do you have any plans in translating any of the other books that came before Hex? So far, none of the um, books before. Um, I, I like to see Hex, you know, you know, I was very young when I started out, right? I was like 18 when my first book was published. Wow. Um, I, I felt Hex is the one, it's my breakthrough book that um, is... In, in my taste good enough that i can you know proudly show it to the world basically wow and, and from there i want to go up so okay yeah so in my sense you know my next books are going to be all translated i i, I am halfway through a new one uh, which is called november uh, i'm writing it right now in this nice swiss chalet where i'm right now <laughs> <laughs> okay, looks there. cozy yeah <laughs> um and let's go on. Let's go to be dark as well. <laughs> That's so, so great. Uh, did you, um, so, uh, my mind just went a little blank. Oh, for these translations. So you, you mentioned that there had to be some tweaks with Echo, uh, linguistic changes. Um, were there any other substantive changes between the Dutch edition and uh, the English translated? Like, for example, Hex, you changed the ending. Oh, did yeah. You do, did you do anything else with the story that was substantive? Well, in Hex, it was the ending, but also the entire setting, because the original right. was set in the Netherlands, and I, I rewrote the whole book for with an American setting. Mm-hmm. Um, Echo, you know, it was quite a process to do that. It was uh, very time-consuming, very complicated. And I figured, you know, with Echo... I have a very international setting. It sets partly in the Catskills in New York, partly in Amsterdam, and partly in the Swiss Alps. Uh, there's the American narrator and there's the Dutch narrator. So I figured that's yeah. an international combo enough to, to keep it as is. What, what we did change, though, is when my U.S. editor, Miriam Weinberg at Nightfire, read uh, the first version of the edited translation. I, you know, the translator translates it, I edit it, and then we show it to her. Um, she said, if we change the order of chapters a little bit, you get a completely different uh, build of tension. Huh. Try this out and see if you like it. And I did. And I really liked it, actually. So um, it mainly had to do with uh, their, uh, in the Dutch version, I mean, there, there's a good part of the book where Nick describes his events that happened during that, you know, that faithful expedition in the mountains. In the Dutch edition of the book that was all concentrated in one part at the beginning of the book, um, Miriam suggested, what if you cut that in little pieces and, you know, um, give it to us in in small doses throughout the story, you get a completely, completely different experience. And I like the way that played out. So that yeah, was- I did. I did too. And I, I, I do like the way that gives you a peak and then you're back in what happened and you go back to yeah. what happened up in the mountains. So yeah, I, I thought that did, did a really good job of knowing that Sam knows more than the reader, mm-hmm. even at where you're at. And he does refer, I read the manuscript and it's about what, 200 pages he says at yeah. some point. And, and so you're like, oh, Sam's already more informed than we are. And you're kind of let in on it in doses. Yeah. 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 No, that was that was that was that was an interesting take. I, I do wonder about that. I know when Stephen King wrote it, he wrote um chapters that flash back and forth. And I always wondered about that. And I did like that effect yeah. of, of taking you in and out. But yeah, um, it, it's it's 
it's fun to deconstruct stories and to build them up from scratch again and 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 see how even with a change of order you can change the whole reading experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, very, it's very interesting it becomes a little bit technical but it's it's fun to play with yeah yeah no for sure um the reason I was asking about those first four books, uh, I'm, I'm deciding on whether I should learn Dutch or not. So uh, <laughs> you're, you're going to lead a whole industry on people just, you know, the arc, you know, I, I bought the arc, I got the arc. That's one thing, but uh, to get earlier and earlier reading on Thomas Oldehuvelt books, I'm going to have to learn Dutch. Well, yep. 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 I'm afraid so. <laughs> oh, I, I um, once actually wrote a story originally in English. Uh, it is called, uh, you know how the story goes. It, it's published on tour.com, I think. Um, it's the one time that I actually experienced with writing in English directly. It went okay, but yeah. at the same time, it's not my mother tongue and, and it's still, I feel more freedom in Dutch yeah. because it's just what my language is. So, right. and I, I mean, I, I have fantastic translators. Uh, Nancy Forrest Fleer, who did Hex, she did a fantastic job. And Marsh Jalula, who translated Echo, great as well. He's also translating Oracle. Um, yeah, I'm really blessed with good translators. And I like working with them. Yeah, I think that's an important relationship um, that you, you have to. And I like that, that you look at that translation afterwards. And Yeah, because, you know, that way I can still have some control over what the English language manuscript is going to be. And it's also because... From English, it is translated into many more languages because it's for international publishers much, well, cheaper actually to translate from English than from Dutch because right. a lot more people can speak English. Um, so um, I want that translation to be exactly where I want it to be. Yeah, I, I read um, a John Avide Linkvist uh, book, a short story. So I, I read uh, Let the Right One In, adored that book. And then I read a short story that was in an anthology and it, it was, it was called shining in the dark. Let the um, old dream die. That's, that's in. That's you probably right. Uh, yes. Th that actually is, um, let the right one in. I thought let the old dreams die was a novella follow-up, but I, maybe I'm wrong. No, this is a, a short story. Well, there are some novellas oh. in there and short stories as well. Okay. Basically, yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah, but I read um, uh, a short story that was collected in uh, an anthology called "Shining in the Dark," and okay. it didn't. It, it the, the story was good, but it I think the language was different, and I thought it might have been uh, an example of the translation wasn't as elegant or as mm -hmm. as powerful as the intended. Um, is the first draft. So I can, I can sympathize with you feeling uh, that's, that's definitely an important hurdle to get, to get past. And if you have a good relationship, then I think it's uh, smoother. It is, you know, as a Dutch speaking person, I am probably way more used to reading translations than you are as an, as an, you know, an English speaker because. Oh, sure a good deal of the books that you find in Dutch bookstores are translations. I mean, we have our own authors, obviously, but, you know, right. um, a lot of books are translated from English or German or French or what have you. And um, when it's done well, you don't realize you're reading a translation. Mm -hmm. so, right, right. You know, I mean, translation is an art and it's an important art because it, you know, literally transports stories across borders. Um, and... When they when translations are done well, you you don't have a sense that you're reading a translation. Sometimes you have a sense, hmm, is this what the writer meant, or is this a, what the translator meant? Um, e even with uh, you know popular authors like Stephen King, for instance, when I read the Dutch translation and compare it to the original, um, King uses more wordplay in his language, and sometimes the stuff that you just cannot translate. Right. Um, when Moshe translated Echo, I told him, you know, um, go all out. I mean, oh, cool. go, you know, have fun with it, be creative with it. It's more important that these voices are 
good than that it's a literal one-on-one -on -one translation of what I wrote in Dutch because that never really works. Um, and he did that and he went all out and sometimes it was fantastic. And whenever it was a little bit too much or when I didn't like it, I changed something and that's okay. Um, but I'm really happy with the, with the result. Yeah, it's, it's a spectacular book. I, uh, I chewed it up um, and I hated to end it. Uh, <laughs> I hated, I hated when it was over again. I, I I'm serious when I say I felt like I was a 15 year old kid reading Stephen King again. Uh, oh. it, it, it feels like classic chills and um, it That's just fired on all cylinders. Me. <laughs> Pardon? That's the biggest compliment you can give to me. Oh. You know? that, that experience when you are a kid and you're reading horror under the blankets with your flashlight. I mean, that's that's perfect. <laughs> when when the impossible feels like it's right outside your window, when 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 you start to look around you with a little more suspicion, that book gets to you. That that means mm -hmm. that there's there's a your 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 suspension of disbelief kind of goes out the window because you can believe in anything now, yeah. and that magic is a rare magic, and um, it's usually reserved for children because they don't know enough. They're not educated. Their imaginations are not educated out of them yet. They still have that. They fill in all the blanks with wonder yeah. and awe. And and for me, that that came rushing back in. Um, so I was delighted. Uh, I didn't know. There's sometimes you, you read an author and this book really clicked with you. And the next one, it's it's good, but it didn't really. I'm telling you, I was I was blown away. And um I, I just, I would really love if Paul Suntump would do a limited of this. I think there are so many visual things, bird feathers. Uh, well, that's on the, that's on Hex. And it's interesting. I don't even think about that. Hex has peacock. This, I, I don't even know how to say, are they chos? Um, the, the, the mountain the, bird. Um, oh yeah. The, 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 what are they called in English again? Um, uh, Wait, let it me was like C H O U G H S, and I I, I never Chugs, I don't know how Chugs, to say that. Chugs. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Alpine chugs. Yeah. And they're 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 menacing. They're also mournful, but yeah, mm -hmm. it it was it was so good, and uh, I I love seeing you promote the book, and I think you're just such a uh, accessible good guy that when I saw those Instagram stories and you're pointing to the mountain, that's the mountain. <laughs> obviously there's a joy in what you're doing and i just I'm, I'm glad to see that and i like supporting that i think um well and thank you so much i mean for me i've always approached my storytelling in a way that you know when i write a story it's mine and i can do whatever i want with it but when i publish it it's your story and i need your imagination to yeah. make the story work right so the reader is a really important part of my story and that's why i love it to go out there and meet readers wherever i can i i for hex i toured on four different continents and you know in south america north america asia europe and then and, um to meet readers everywhere is just a delight and i cannot wait for the pandemic to be over and to i know soon and, uh, yeah 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 hopefully later this year i'll uh I'll come to the United States. I also thought it was interesting that Nick has to wear that bandage across his face in a time when we're all going through a pandemic. Obviously, you didn't plan that, did you? Did you... No, Echo was actually written and finished before COVID hit. Okay, yes, that's right. Um, because it came out in the Netherlands in 2019. Uh, so that that that's just a... Uh, uh, a Very interesting. It was, <laughs> yeah. I, you know, that, that idea of, because there's that, there's that level of, and I think we've all experienced it when you wear that mask, it is, it's, it's a little dehumanizing or a little bit, I don't want to say dehuman, it sounds very drastic, but the idea that you're, you're now becoming more faceless and, yeah. uh, and how, how Nick oh, was with there's that. that. There's that, there's that scene in Echo when Sam comes back to Amsterdam and sees his, you know, his partner for the first time he has his face wrapped in bandages and he's in he's in the, he lives in the basement now and it, it's all very very gothic and he's drawn with a sharpie did this smiley mouth on his face and yeah you know 
whenever I'm smiling, you know, it's me. <laughs> you know? Oh, that was so creepy. That, yeah. and, and, and the way he was in the basement and he was un, he was moving around, not like a human would move. Oh, yes. Uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's awesome. Like, again, again, it's, you know, and even people hearing this, um, <clears throat> these are not spoilers because when the story goes that direction, you move it somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it does, it, there is this uh, swinging pendulum where I couldn't have predicted how it was going to go. Um, it kept me wanting to know and invested in the characters every step of the way. And the scenes of mountain climbing are beautiful. Uh, and, and the whole thing, the whole thing <laughs> is awesome. So I appreciate you taking the time to chat with me. I know you're such a busy guy. When we set this up, you're like, I have 90 minutes on the 9th. That's it. <laughs> but I know you're you're probably going crazy with with all the uh, promotions and everything. But it's fun. It's fun. I like it. Are you going to do any book tours? You, uh, you know, uh, talking with you about Echo. I mean, yeah, uh, I'm so glad you did because you know, uh, I obviously I don't think I was done with the book when I reached out. I don't remember. Um. I think you were still reading it. Yeah, I might have been. I might have been. But yeah, I was already in the grip of it. And uh, it's a, a fantastic. I can't wait for Oracle. Um, and then you have another one after that. So do you think there'll be one book a year? That is what I'm trying to um, aim for now. I, I, my, my biggest flaw as a writer, I think, has always been that um, I haven't been extremely productive in the sense that um, you know, there are writers who can, you know, yeah, check out one book a year easily or two books a year. Um, I usually was a little bit slower after Hex. Uh, it, it's taken me six years to now give you yeah. Echo because Hex's success also froze me. Um, I really had to find the joy back in writing for a bit because I lost it and I, the pressure. Uh, I felt was just too high. I've overcome that and good, good. never been any more productive than it is now. And I'm trying to, you know, go for one book a year. So fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, me too. I, I, I'm rooting for you. Do you think you'll be doing any uh, tours or you're just waiting for the pandemic to be over? Well, it's likely that I'll go to StokerCon in April, uh, sorry, in May in Denver. Okay. Um, and uh, probably September, October, I'm planning for some more events in the United States. So in Canada. Very. Yeah. Well, definitely keep me posted. I'll share it here on my page and, and other places. And um, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, definitely, I think I'm, I'm looking forward to getting my hardcovers uh, just, you know, just to have on the shelf. Collectors yep. got to do that. Of course. Um, <laughs> So, um, so I'm looking forward to that. I'm greatly looking forward to Oracle. Um, and I'm going to tune in when you talk to Paul Tremblay tonight, which is like what, in an hour from now for you? Yeah. It's about an hour. I think. Yeah. 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 So get, get something to drink, get refreshed, hydrate. <laughs> well, but, uh, it's pretty it's, late. It's midnight now in Switzerland where I am. So it's, uh, why totally- are you, so that's late. Yeah. Why you just, it's- the time difference. <laughs> can yeah, <happen>. yeah. <laughs> well, well, be careful if you have to, if you wrap it up and then you shut the lights off and you have to use the restroom and make sure there's no one on the stairs. There is a staircase here in the chalet. Just so, be careful. Uh, <laughs> I go to the right. on, I think. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for joining me and I wish you all the best and um, you, I'll man. keep reading. We'll see each other when I come to the States. Yes, for sure. Where are to. you located, actually? I'm in Chicago, but uh, yeah, Chicago, yeah, totally, yeah. we're yeah. probably going to be moving east a little bit. Okay. I don't know when that'll happen, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I I would love to meet you in person and shake your hand. and We'll make that happen. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. All right. All right. Thanks so much, All right. man. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>